Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us on Business Incorporated. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago. On the program today, World Trade Organization predicts a 9.2% decline in the volume of world merchandise trade for 2020. Libya's central bank calls for resumption of oil output and exports. South African Union strike to protest graft and job losses. Well, let's get the show started now with the markets and investor sentiments in major African markets were mostly positive except Nigeria's main index which reversed the positive trend since, since the beginning of the month. The NSC declined 1.19% at intraday while South Africa's JSA index was marginally higher by 0.01%. The market in Egypt resumed trading today after a holiday with the EGX 30 jumping 1.68%. Kenya closed negative on Tuesday. It's a different picture in the Middle East where major markets were mostly negative except the Abu Dhabi index which added 0.26%. On the flip side, Dubai's index declined 0.57%. Elsewhere in the region, the Qatari index trimmed 0.84%, while Saudi Arabia's index lost 0.21%. Okay, let's see what's um, happening in London as a market threat as Trump pulls plug on stimulus package talks. Let's bring in Juliana, my colleague now. Hello, Juliana. Good afternoon. Well, any investor who thought Donald Trump's uh, departure from Walter Reed Medical Center would bring some calm had a root shock last night. Are the markets in London also reacting to that? They are reacting. You're right, uh, Chimese. Of course, everybody's looking at that chaotic uh, US political state, especially as they've got the vice president um, uh, uh, debate going on with Kamala Harris and uh, Mike Pence uh, later today. So all eyes are on that. But most importantly, as you said, it was about uh, US President Donald Trump and Twitter. Two tweets, one to say that he had stopped uh, speaking to lawmakers about that huge stimulus uh, package, which I'm sure all Americans are waiting for. And then then, uh, just a couple of hours later, he said he may indeed uh, do some sort of uh, fiscal stimulus, just not as much as was intended. So as to be expected, that sent uh, markets across the world into a frenzy, including here in London. At intraday, the all share is down 0.02 percent. The FTSE 100 is down 0.10 percent and the FTSE 250 uh, slightly up by 0.09 percent. In currencies, the British pound is down on the US dollar by 0.12 percent, down on the euro by 0.12 0.26% and up on the Japanese yen by 0.37%. And shares in Tesco had jumped 2.3% this morning. Investors are chaired that Tesco is hiking its interim dividend by over 20%. Is Tesco likely to face pressure over a dividend hike? Well, not at all. You know, that's the game of the markets, isn't it? If your company does well, uh, then the shareholders are rewarded. And that's exactly the story for Tesco. In fact, uh, their shares uh, rose as high as 4% in early trading. And that's because they've had a massive, uh, stupendous uh, profit surge in the six months up until uh, July. Their, uh, their Tesco half-year profits increased by 28.7% to £555 million, pounds, as well as shares shareholders uh, receiving a pretty tasty um, uh, dividend. Uh, staff also received a 10% bonus, which is absolutely amazing considering just how hard uh, uh, grocer uh, workers have been working throughout the pandemic. So they were rewarded by that. Tesco did say that they did spend a lot of money on PPE equipment, trying to keep people away from each other and reorganising their stores. But still, that didn't uh, stick into their profits. Their profits are up 29% more than they were this time last Last year. That's exactly why uh, their shareholders have been rewarded. They've also obviously got some big news. Their CEO, uh, Dave Lewis, he stepped down last week um, and he had really uh, been through a lot uh, with Tesco. Tesco have been up and down. They are still Britain's largest retailer, but they have had a few scandals over the past couple of years. And now a lot of these uh, European stores like Lidl and Audi are trying to come in and take a piece of their share in the market, but they still do um, have that lion's share. And as you said, They've uh, uh, got um, superb um, uh, an update for their shareholders, which is why they're one of the biggest uh, risers on the FTSE All Share today. 
And recent data shows mortgage applications in the UK have surged to a 12-year high as house prices rose at the fastest annual pace since mid-2016. What is driving house prices at this pandemic time? Oh, well, there are several things, and we have uh, discussed this quite extensively. It appears to be the uh, stamp duty suspension. This was part of uh, the Rishi Shunak's um, uh, presence or gift, shall I say, to those who have been suffering through the pandemic. He really wanted to see some house uh, market activity, and really that's exactly what's happening. We've also seen um, pent-up demand from house buyers. Of course, the market uh, did close, as with most things, on the 23rd of March when Prime Minister Boris Johnson locked down the uh, country, uh, the housing market was one of the first um, sectors to be opened up and lots of people started rushing uh, to buy their new homes. I think a lot of observers or people that work closely within the industry are really putting um, uh, the surge in uh, mortgage applications, the surge in mortgage activity and the rise in house prices uh, down to the look and feel of the house. A lot of people obviously don't live in London, uh, they commute to London and working from home made a lot of people look around and say, do you know what, I want more space, I want a cleaner, greener uh, lifestyle. And uh, this is reflected um, in the surge in activity and the surge in house prices. But, and there's always a but, uh, you know, there are concerns that there will be a downward trend in the next couple of months. And really that's because uh, the government's most famous coronavirus scheme, the furlough scheme, will come to an end at the end of this month. In just a couple of weeks, we are expecting a huge surge in unemployment. And of course, if you're not sure about where your next check is coming from, you're not really uh, going to be applying for a home. Thanks, Juliana, for those um, intraday update. And, of course, European stocks were reddish this morning as investors digested a robust round of earnings and President Trump's decision to hold stimulus talks until after the November election. These and more are what Chelsea will be talking to us about. Hello, Chelsea. Good afternoon. Well, U.S. President Donald Trump's decision to pull out of the stimulus talks rippled through markets. How are markets there in Europe reacting? It's definitely been a volatile day for stocks around the world as investors try to figure out what exactly is going on uh, with stimulus talks in the U.S. Yesterday, uh, we had tweets from President Trump saying that he had instructed uh, uh, his Republicans to, to stop having talks with uh, Democrats over a more than $1 trillion stimulus effort. This was a major shock to the markets because all we'd heard over the past couple of weeks was how uh, the two sides were getting closer together and how both Democrats, Republicans, and Trump himself really did want to see a stimulus package um, uh, come through before the election. So this definitely uh, was a bit confusing for people. Um, we also have heard since then, though, that Trump would be open to um, these so-called standalone bills, so this would be not a, a massive, wide-scale uh, 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 stimulus effort around $2 trillion as has been proposed, but it would be a much smaller package that would um, directly send money to, for example, airlines or small businesses. Um, and it would also include another round of $1,200 uh, stimulus checks for Americans. Um, that has been received, that's, that has helped uh, ease concern that there won't be any stimulus, but economists say that even with the, these uh, standalone bills, that's really not a substitute for uh, a large-scale stimulus. Um, the $1,200 checks really won't get people who have lost their jobs really far, uh, as opposed to the what had been proposed before, which would be an extension of unemployment benefits that was giving people around $600 extra dollars a week. So uh, $1,200 really doesn't fill that gap for the more than 10 million Americans who lost their jobs and still haven't gotten them back through the pandemic. So uh, still a lot of uh, still a lot of questions about what exactly uh, the strategy is for, for President Trump and how likely there is to be stimulus. But what's on the table now is not really enough to uh, bring the economy out of its slump. Meanwhile, investors are growing increasingly concerned about the health of the Spanish economy as the country battles the pandemic, Spain laid out its strategy for an economic recovery today. What are they planning? 
So Spain is planning to spend a, a lot of money over the next couple of years. They are expected to receive about 140 billion euros from uh, the stimulus package that has been agreed upon by EU leaders. That still hasn't been officially passed, but uh, it is expected to be passed at some point. And, and Spain would be one of the biggest recipients of, of money from that pot. Um, so they would spend that money on industries and, and particularly in areas such as digitalization, um, which has been a big effort on the on the EU's part to, to make sure that these economies are, are modernizing. So that would account for uh, really the bulk of their spending. Uh, but they also do plan to spend um, a significant amount of money as well on uh, green in, uh, investments. So they want to uh, make their energy sources more sustainable. They want to uh, increase the amount of renewable energy in the economy. Um, but they also have a pretty clear target for jobs. They want to create about 800,000 jobs over the next three years. Um, for Spain, that's that's very important because they have one of the highest unemployment rates in Europe. It's, it's already at about 20%. Um, and so there are clearly a lot of people that need jobs in Spain. Um, so they have laid out this plan. Whether it actually uh, will go forward in this form is a question. Spain has been a politically innovative gridlock in this package would have to be passed by Spanish Parliament, um, but they do have a, a plan that would help them return to growth over the next couple of years. And back in Germany where you are, we've heard that curfews are being implemented both in Frankfurt, where you are, and um, also in capital Berlin amid a surge in coronavirus infections. How strict are these new measures? They certainly aren't the strictest in Europe um, yet. If you look at, for example, Madrid, uh, they're really in, at a full lockdown again. Paris has um, closed all bars and, and uh, gyms and things like that for the next couple of weeks. Here in Germany, they are still um, trying to make sure that there are severe restrictions on, on daily movement, but both Berlin and Frankfurt uh, are experiencing pretty significant increases in cases. Both are teetering around the, the line of 50 infections uh, per 100,000 residents, and that's really seen um, as the level that uh, is very important to stay under uh, if you want to keep the pandemic under control. So what they've both proposed is uh, a, a curfew that will go into effect this weekend. Um, it will mean that bars and restaurants have to close around 10 or 11, uh, depending on the city. And they also both have re-implemented um, social distancing restrictions so people won't be able to, to gather in these big groups again. Um, it's unclear whether this will be enough to keep uh, the virus under control in these cities if, if the, the number of infections continues to rise. Both could have to consider uh, more strict restrictions uh, on, on public life, which of course uh, they are trying to avoid right now given the, what we saw earlier this year and the economic implications of um, wide-scale restrictions on public life. All right, thank you Chelsea for updating us on those. The World Trade Organization has predicted a 9.2% decline in the volume of world merchandise trade for 2020 from the 12.9% forecast in April this year. According to WTO Street Statistics and Outlook, the forecast is as a result of strong trade performance in June and July, which has brought some signs of optimism for overall trade growth in 2020. The Global Trade Organization explains that trade growth in COVID-19 related products was particularly strong in these months, showing trade's ability to help governments obtain needed supplies. WTO forecast shows that merchandise trade will rise by 7.2% in 2021, but will remain well below the pre-crisis trend. It adds that the estimates are subject to an unusual high degree of uncertainty from the COVID-19 pandemic and government responses to it. And South African unions representing workers across a range of industries embarked on a one-day national strike today, dealing a further blow to an economy battered by the coronavirus. The protest was called by the Congress of South African Trade Unions, the country's largest labor group, to highlight a litany of grievances, including job losses, an inadequate public transport system, 
corruption and state spending curbs. The country's other three main labor associations endorsed the decision to down tools. Africa's most industrialized economy shared 2.2 million jobs in the second quarter after a five-week lockdown shuttered most businesses, with the central bank expecting it to contract 8.2% this year. Outrage among workers who retain their jobs and face pressure to support those affected by the meltdown has been stoked by allegations that state contracts to provide protective equipment to tackle the coronavirus were tainted by graft. And Libya's central bank governor, Sadiq al kabir has called for an immediate resumption of oil operations to shore up the economy amid an unprecedented decline in monetary reserves. He says Libya needs to raise the production to 1.7 million barrels per day to cover the country's spending. According to him, shutting down the country's oil operations repeatedly from 2013 to 2020 has generated about $180 billion loss. And the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry says the growing level of Nigeria's total debt profile is a call for concern, putting into account the level of output growth and economic development in the country. The concerns by the Chamber is coming on the heels of calls by the World Bank seeking debt cancellation for developing countries amid the impact of the coronavirus and fall in oil price on global economies. According to the President of the Chamber, Toki Mabugunje, at a quarterly economic briefing in Lagos, the country's debt stock is possibly going to hit 34 trillion by year end, a figure she believes will be unsustainable for the country. The Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry is deeply concerned about the country's rising debt portfolio without corresponding impact on output growth and economic development. According to official statistics from the Debt Management Office, Public debt stock grew by 8% to 31 trillion naira at the end of the second quarter, equivalent to 21% of GDP. We note that the increase in public debt stock was fueled by fresh domestic and external borrowing required to plug the wider fiscal deficit in the revised 2020 budget, given the impact of the pandemic on oil and non-oil sources of revenue. We also note the impact of the recent exchange rate depreciation on the country's level of extended indebtedness, external indebtedness. At the peak of the pandemic in the second quarter, the federal government received financial support worth 3.4 billion US dollars and 288.5 million US dollars from the International Monetary Fund, IMF, and the African Development Bank, AFDB, respectively. While negotiations are also taking place for the cumulative $1.8 billion credit support from the World Bank, the African Development Bank, second tranche, and the Islamic Development Bank. Adding this to prospective domestic issuances could possibly push the country's public debt stock to about 34 trillion naira by year end, equivalent to 23% of GDP. The growing level of the country's debt is fast becoming unsustainable in the light of dwindling oil prices and production. Our position is reinforced by the uptrend in debt service to revenue ratio from 60% by year end 2019 to 72% as of May 2020. The high level of debt service debt servicing continues to hinder robust investments in hard and soft infrastructure, which are key to stimulating productivity and improving living standards. And still here in Nigeria, 2016 program by the government to address uh, uh, the, the, by auctioning rights to capture and sell flared gas seems to be struggling. Experts say gas that Nigeria flares nationwide could be worth billions of dollars if captured and transported to be used as liquefied natural gas or for plastics or fertilizers. Behind a 20-foot wall of burning gas sending waves of heat over Root Ohoteka, the 25-year-old dries and sorts cassava flakes popularly referred to as tapioca in Nigeria. She is using the high temperature from the burning gas to dry the flakes 
which she will later sell, but worries about the effects the fumes will have on her health. Like Ohoteka, nearly half of Nigerians have no power, yet the government's attempt to harness gas belching from its oil fields to generate urgently needed electricity or revenue have stalled. And it's very, very, very eat. They eat our chest. So I said, go to the so go go find me bad credit. So my eyes, they would they tell myself, yeah, come, they set the fire, come outside. The eye go, they tell me. So there's no money. If you say I go live now, my children will die. If we myself, I will still die. Nigeria first targeted gas flaring in the late 1970s and through various schemes and regulations, has more than halved it since 2001. Chevron, Shell, and any which operate in Nigeria say they have cut flaring by some 90% and are working to cut it further. The coronavirus crisis has compounded delays to a project which the World Bank hoped could serve as an example in its bid to cut global warming through zero flaring globally by 2030. Most of the species of animal has left the location because of the flare sites. Continuous flare sites will make the night become very like day. So there are some animals that cannot sustain the daylight of it. Without progress towards its 2030 target of virtually eliminating flaring, which releases carbon dioxide along with polluting methane and soot, Nigeria cannot meet its pledge to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 20%. For instance, we had 2008, we had 2010, we've also had 2020. And this is 2020 and we're heading 2030. Is it that the government is not sincere in trying to protect the lives and properties of the communities? Is it that the government is not interested in fines that they can get from the oil companies? Or is it that the fact that the companies are taking the government for a ride? That is why the companies are feeling very, very comfortable. Gas output at some where oil fields are in decline is likely to end within five to 10 years, and others are offshore, making the required infrastructure more costly. And with that report, we wrap up today's edition of the program. Thank you for watching. I'm Chimizi Obi Iwago.